everybody. My name is Brandon Adams, and this is Before the Hedge, is presented by Kroger. And I know what a lot of you are thinking right now as you get settled in for what you've come to expect every Wednesday afternoon at this time, an hour's worth of recruiting talk. And I'm going to go ahead and say it for you and say it out loud so it can kind of serve as the single question for the entire group. Where's Jeff? Uh, obviously, when it comes to the recruiting talk around here, we lean on Jeff's intel quite heavily. Jeff is not able to be with us here today. But there is good news, however, 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 even though Jeff is not sitting beside me for the full hour, like always, I was able to record an interview with Jeff that's going to be substantial. We hit on a lot of topics, a lot of the stuff in the aftermath of what happened for Georgia on Saturday against Notre Dame, the latest on the running back situation, the fact that Tank Bigsby was in Athens, by the way, what Zachary Evans meant with that somewhat cryptic tweet going back to last Friday. So all the hot topics and the big issues, I deal with all of those with Jeff going back to uh, this past, uh, you know, basically on the interview you're about to hear in, coming in a few minutes, I go and deal with all the issues that have been going on going back to like the last week or so. So uh, if you have come to expect Jeff's Intel as part of Before the Edge is presented by Kroger, you will get a version of Jeff's Intel here coming up in a few minutes. Before we get to that, though, if you don't mind, I'd love to be able to take care of a few pieces of business myself that have been kind of going on with recruiting here and kind of lean on some of what's out there in terms of what I think Georgia fans ought to be interested in right now. Let me start with this. I don't think there's anything that fans like more than seeing families of UGA commits, UGA commits themselves, doing some heavy-duty recruiting for the Georgia Bulldogs. Well, there was an example of that on social media within the last 24 hours or so. Jeff Sintel was talking about Theo Johnson, the four-star tight end. Jeff's got a great piece up with Theo at dognation.com. Jeff, like any good writer would do, shares that article regarding Theo Johnson on Twitter, and Chris Milton, the father of Kendall Milton, who, by the way, was also in Athens this past Saturday, Chris Milton comes up on Twitter, and he had a message for Theo Johnson that Georgia fans, I think, would all resonate with, and Georgia fans are going to love the fact that the father of uh, Kendall Milton is out there pushing for UGA. Chris Milton says, come home, Theo. Obviously, the Milton family, despite the fact they live out in California, they have seemingly come to think of Athens as home. They had a great time on their collective visit to Athens this past Saturday for the uh, Notre Dame game. We'll have more on that coming up in a moment. And they seem to think that Theo Johnson would be pretty happy, too, where he'd also settle in. And I guess I'm starting to feel like there's a pretty good chance that maybe that does indeed happen. We've had the series of tweets from Georgia tight ends coach Todd Hartley, for instance, referencing the super teams, all the NBA tandems, the Pippins and the Jordans and the LeBron James and the Dwayne Wades. There was Kobe and Shaq the other day, and he had the fire and ice tweet the other day as well. So he's clearly kind of putting it out there. So maybe Theo Johnson eventually viewing UGA as home. Maybe one day there's a chance that'll be true. Johnson, as I said before, did talk to our buddy Jeff Sintel. Jeff's got a great piece up at dognation.com about that interview and about that conversation. There is one piece in particular that I want to make sure you notice from Jeff's article with Theo Johnson. Johnson reflecting on his Feelings about the official visit and kind of where things go from him on that. If you're watching on video, I'll show you this here. This is Johnson in his own work. He says, I thought it was a great official. I'm definitely coming out of the visit feeling positive about Georgia for sure. He also goes on to say, a big thing I'm still processing and thinking about with the visit is how, I, how comfortable I feel with the guys and stuff like that. How do I feel about Coach Kirby Smart? How do I feel about Coach Hartley right now? That's what I'm processing right now. That's the four-star tight end, Theo Johnson, talking about his feelings with the coaching staff. Now, he mentions Hartley by name. One of the things that we know is Hartley's already been really good at working with these tight ends, not just Johnson, but Darnell Washington as well. And really, there have been a number of elite tight ends for this class of 2020 who've put themselves with Georgia as one of their finalists, and Hartley gets a lot of the credit for that. He did great work towards the end of the 2019 cycle, bringing a guy like Brett Scyther. So, if you are left to say that Theo Johnson's final piece of evaluation is truly how he feels about Smart and Hartley, I think most Georgia fans would feel pretty good about how their tight ends coach stacks up to some of the others. Now, Alabama does have a five-star quarterback to mid now. Uh, all of a sudden, that 2020 class all of a sudden may have a little more dra gravitational pull to it than it would have had before. Theo Johnson's obviously also been uh, heavily recruited by a lot of the Big Ten programs, a lot of those that which use the tight end pretty heavily. And yet it seems like Georgia... He's in a pretty good position for Johnson right now on the basis of the official visit they're able to host and the dazzling display put on at Sanford Stadium on Saturday night. It seems like Georgia's in a pretty good spot here, and it seems like Georgia's got a couple good 
coaches leading the way when it comes to Smart and Hartley. And by the way, it wasn't just coaches who were recruiting Theo Johnson uh, this past Saturday. It's been Chris Milton on Twitter this week, but they are in the building there that night. It was 2020 Georgia quarterback commit Carson Beck. He had kind of a cool picture on Instagram of himself with both Johnson and Darnell Washington, the other big elite tight end that Georgia's in the mix for right now, the five-star out of Nevada. And the, um, the, the quote, the comment from Beck to his own picture was, stay tuned, essentially saying that he, as the quarterback, believes that these two big targets, Theo and Darnell, will be guys he's able to throw the football to. And when you look at Jeff Sintel's piece at dognation.com, you also see a little bit more about Darnell and Theo and their, rela- their uh, relationship with each other and their interactions with each other going back to this past week. And that's another thing I think that makes you feel pretty good about that is the fact that Georgia's obviously very much out in the open recruiting both these tight ends. Both those guys seem comfortable enough with that, that they were together at the same time on the UGA campus, and they both seemingly have a kind of a joking, friendly relationship with each other. So that's a pretty good sign for this thing may be heading as we move on. As I said before, it's Before the Hedges presented by Kroger. My name's Brandon Adams. We are going to get more from Jeff Sintel on this topic and a whole lot more a little bit later on. We share an interview I was able to conduct with Jeff. Obviously, you're on our program. You've come to expect Jeff Sintel when it comes to recruiting talk, and you'll get at least a version of Jeff Sintel, a nice extended conversation with him coming up in just a couple of moments. I'll also take a lot of your comments here today as well. Let me also remind you about my friends at Kroger, uh, and they've got pumpkin flavors back right now, which is good news. Maybe kind of get you in that fall mood here a little bit. You can save on everything pumpkin-related. Pumpkin spice coffee, pumpkin pies, pumpkin scented candles. It's all there for you to kind of get you ready for the holiday season. We're going to do top targets here in just a moment. Before we check in on kind of where Theo and Darnell rank on the list of top targets for Georgia in its 2020 class, let me at least take a couple minutes here to check in on their comment section before we get in here and do that, give you a chance to kind of weigh in and shout out and talk about whatever you want to just for a moment. Starting here on Facebook here for a moment as well. Um, uh, by the way, Whitney Spires on the uh, subject of uh, Zachary Evans. She thinks he ends up in uh, Alabama. As of right now, that's not what Evans is saying. I guess he's also been busy on Instagram here a little bit this week, you know, mentioning Georgia, mentioning LSU. Seemingly, I, I was told this anyway. After the other day, it's he it, it certainly made it sound like he'd 100% made up his mind. It sounds like there are lots of twists and turns to go with the uh, Zachary Evans recruitment. Could Alabama still be a factor? Maybe so. Somehow, I think it's likely to be Georgia, maybe LSU, maybe Texas A&M, the school that he did attend on Saturday for their game against Auburn. And by the way, he saw an Aggies team they can't run the football at all, so they want to sell him on early playing time. They can certainly do that. Uh, let, we'll do a couple more here on Facebook and then uh, YouTube before we uh, do our top target. Joel Moody says, hopefully Georgia will throw to the tight ends more the uh, next few games. I, I think that Theo and Darnell would certainly like to uh, see that. Uh, there's uh, there's no doubt about that. They, he would probably enjoy that. Georgia has done a pretty good job of in, involving some of those guys. Wolf in particular has uh, caught the ball a pretty good bit this season, more so than he was back when he was playing at Tennessee, at least. So that's something that Georgia can kind of argue for in their favorite. Uh, Mike Anderson says Georgia needs tight end playmakers, much like Cole Komet was for for Notre Dame this past week. And I can't argue with you there. Uh, Komet was a big, big target for Notre Dame on Saturday. And I like tight ends. Y'all know that. I'd love to see Georgia use theirs as effectively as, as Notre Dame did with Komet this past Saturday. Um, Frank Patterson, the subject of the game on Saturday, something needs to be said for winning a game, even when you don't play your best, not to mention being a top 10 team. And Frank, I think to that point, I think the recruits are probably pretty happy with what they saw on Saturday. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Chris Rocky says, what are your thoughts on Noah Sewell? The good news about that, Chris, is that's one of the questions I asked Dog Nation's recruiting insider Jeff Sintel. So when you hear from Jeff in a little bit, you'll hear us talking about Noah Sewell, which is obviously a very relevant question here today. Uh, Zafang Yangren says, how do I listen to your Falcon show? And first of all, Zafang, I appreciate you checking in. I hope I didn't mispronounce your name. Uh, AJC Atlanta Falcons News now every Monday and Friday at 1 p.m. That's the name of the Facebook page. For, for now, we're Facebook only on that show. It's every Monday and Friday at 1 p.m. AJC Falcons News now. Uh, Pinesaw Lemonson says, how about have Connor sit in from Jeff? There's no doubt we'll hear from Connor probably today before we are done, I'm sure. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Georgia Peach uh, talking about the complexities of the Zachary Evans recruitment. Yeah, I think com- complex is a pretty good way to describe that in terms of following the twists and turns. And some of this is some of the stuff that you hear coming out of Houston. You know, who knows what the real story is and some of this kind of stuff. But 
as of now, this seems to be a recruitment that's difficult to predict, which is one of the reasons why uh, a lot of Georgia fans were so happy to hear that Bigsby was indeed on campus this past Saturday because that's a name that continues to be very popular with many Georgia fans. All right, I could take comments all day long. Let me be careful not to get too deep in the show before we take care of some of the business we need to take care of. It's Jeff Sintel coming up in a moment. For now, though, it is a staple of our program before the hedge is presented by Kroger. It's our top targets. Jeff, good enough to fill in the list this week before he left to go out of town. So let's get things started. The number one name on the list being what it has been for a while, I'm assuming anyway, the five-star cornerback Keeley Ringo out of Scottsdale, Arizona. And indeed, Ringo, one of the things that Jeff and I talked about this past Tuesday when he was with us on Dog Nation Daily was the fact that you got to know that Ringo was chomping at the bit. He was not able to be in town for this past weekend, was not able to be a part of that crowd, but you better believe he wanted to be there. And the fact that he remained so steadfast at the top of this list, I think gives you an indication of what Jeff thinks his feelings are about UGA. One way or another, this is a recruit the dog fans continue to feel very good about, and Ringo and his family have seemingly get, given you good reasons for that. Operating on kind of a old-school timeline for right now, taking visits, all-star game commitment, that's been the story for a while. But this is a guy that Jeff continues to think is in uh, good shape when it comes to UGA. He's number one on our list. How about number two on the list? Noah Sewell, the linebacker from Orem, Utah. Got a chance to see him with my own eyes this past Saturday. He certainly looked like he was having a really good time. And it was interesting at our Dog Nation Express tailgate, which we did have uh, this past weekend, to talk to some people about Sewell there because there was some question of, you know, why is it that guys like Jeff just buzz about Sewell the way they do? This big guy at the linebacker position. And what it really comes down to, the reason why Jeff is as intense as he is in his profound respect for Sewell as a player is because of the intersection of what he can do with his size, what he can do with his speed. This is a guy who, if he wanted to strictly focus on being a defensive lineman, would probably be among the nation's most highly rated there at that spot. Uh, being a linebacker because of his speed, it's even more valuable, I think, because he brings that same size to the table at a different position group. This is a unique specimen. I would argue that Georgia has probably recruited linebackers the last couple of years as well as maybe anyone ever has, and that's not a statement that I say lightly. And yet, when you have a chance to go out and get a rare find like what Sewell is, uh, a guy that seems to be of uh, very high character and elite athleticism, along with a pretty brilliant size as well, uh, that's a guy you want to bring in your program. He comes in at number two in our list of top targets here on Before the Hedge is presented by Kroger. Name number three after a couple of defensive guys. Uh, we'll go three and four here with uh, Darnell Washington out of Las Vegas, Jordan Birch out of uh, Columbia, South Carolina. Washington we talked about a little bit more. I think that Georgia has positioned itself very well with these tight ends. Washington was on campus this past Saturday, uh, seemed to be having a great time. I think you're really, really happy with uh, what you see going on there. Uh, Jeff Sintel also cleared something up going back to the forum from Saturday. Uh, there was some scuttlebutt that Jordan Birch was in attendance this past weekend. Apparently, uh, in clarifying on that, Birch indeed was not in Athens this past Saturday. He did attend, I'm guessing, I think, the uh, the South Carolina-Alabama game the week before. That's also his hometown, so you probably don't read too much into that. He was also, I think, expected to be at the Texas A&M-Clemson game, another game in which he did not attend. So maybe a little bit mercurial when it comes to the situation with Birch right now, but not on campus this past Saturday for Georgia. Wanted to make sure we clarified that because we had talked about that some of the Dog Nation forum going back to this past weekend. By the way, on game days, these big recruiting events, a great place to follow along with everything that's going on with UGA recruiting is right there on the forum at forum.dognation.com. Next name on the list after Birch. Uh, how about the other tight end we just mentioned? Yeah, Theo Johnson of Windsor, Ontario. The other half of the fire and ice combination with uh, Darnell Washington. Really interesting to see the recruiting work that Georgia's done with both these guys. Name number six now as we keep it going. Top targets for the class of 2020. Climbing up here a little bit, the young man out of Sly County. How about Zykevius Walker, another defensive line prospect? And, you know, listen, Georgia fans like the in-state products. That's what Walker brings to the table right now. A pretty impressive name and interesting to see from Jeff's perspective, Walker climbing up because it is Jeff who puts this list together. We've talked about Walker plenty. Now uh, Jeff thinks it's time to maybe start talking about him in a little bit more prominent fashion. Pretty interesting declaration there on the part of uh, Jeff Sintel. Keep your eye on that. Next name, top target for the class of 2020, and you see 
a bit of an arrow down right now for the five-star running back, Zachary Evans. If Jeff were here, and I would say this nonetheless, I'm not putting words in his mouth, Jeff has been a little bit, I don't want to say down on Evans necessarily, but certainly the idea that, that, that Georgia and Evans are destined to be together. Go back and listen to Jeff. You'll hear him in his own words coming up in a moment. You can go back to Tuesday's edition of Dog Nation Daily and hear him uh, listen to some of the stuff he said on last week's program. I think that Jeff is very much in a wait-and-see mode about Evans. Maybe that's wait and see about how things kind of shake out with Evans in Houston. You've, you've certainly been aware of the fact that he's been taken off of his uh, high school team, but not for the, at, least, at least the last couple of games. It sounds like now he's ready to make his uh, return back to playing time. That's been a thing. You know, kind of where Georgia stands with the other running backs that might be recruiting, that's a thing. So Georgia's, Jeff's certainly watching this closely right now and taking a bit of a wait-and-see approach about this. Maybe that's the proper the appropriate tact for uh, all fans and observers of this to take there as well. Next name after we get past um, Zachary Evans. Also going down a little bit this week. Interesting to note, one defensive lineman going up in Zykevius Walker, one going down in Javon Dexter. Dexter, of course, the Florida commit. That's at least worth paying a, a little bit of attention to as Georgia continues trying to make great inroads in the state of Florida already with two good-looking defensive line prospects out of the state. Warren Brinson, who at least plays his high school ball there at IMG Academy. Jalen Carter there as well. Maybe George is someone involved on Javon Dexter there as well, but Dexter does have an arrow down next to his name this list on Before the Edges presented by Kroger. Next name on the list, top targets for the class of 2020. Elias Ricks, also a bit of an arrow down right now, but still on the list. When you're talking about an LSU commit and a program that's done so well when it comes to recruiting defensive backs, even being in the mix is maybe as much as George could ask for right now. Of course, one of the key components to this recruitment will be the fact that Ricks has a very strong friendship with five-star UGA running back commit Kendall Milton. So that's at least worth noticing and, and monitoring when it comes to the Ricks situation. The final name on our top targets here, uh, how about a Rick Gilbert who does hold on? At this point in time, boy, it seems like George is a lot farther down the line with Theo and Darnell Washington than it is with the Rick Gilbert. And y'all know. I mean, I come at this from the perspective of a fan, and Gilbert's a player who I'm a fan of. Uh, I think he's done some big things for the Marietta Blue Devils. However, if Georgia doesn't get Gilbert, does get Washington, does get Johnson, you certainly can't say that Georgia hasn't done its job when it comes to tight end recruiting for the class of 2020. So that's the official top ten. Gilbert just makes it on the list this week. How about a uh, list of those names that almost got consideration that didn't? So Tank Bigsby's back on here again, just even though he's an Auburn commit. As we said before, Bigsby was in Athens this past weekend. Another running back goes on here, Don Chaney Jr., the Miami commit. I mean, Jeff had an article with Chaney not too long ago where Chaney certainly didn't seem to leave the door open all that much for uh, Georgia, but apparently something's still uh, going on there. You've got Ashad Johnson, the uh, running back. It's the high school teammate of Cedric Von Prahn. He's on this list. Don't see uh, Marshawn Lloyd's also on this list here right now, too. You see Arian Smith, the wide receiver on here. We'll have more on uh, a pretty interesting piece of recruiting news that involves Arian Smith a little bit later on. Uh, you see also a 2020 quarterback, Jaden DeLara, on this. Jeff's going to explain more on that coming up in just a moment, but we'll make that kind of your top targets for the class of 2020. I don't think Connor's got a, uh, a camera on him, but maybe we can get a microphone going. I'd love to have you uh, weigh in on your thoughts and kind of what Jeff said when it comes to the uh, top targets there. And we'll obviously give all of you a chance to do this too. Uh, top targets, class of 2020, before the hedge is presented by Kroger. Um, J Jason Hester says, who's your pick for that second running back? Is it Tank? Is it Lloyd? Is it Cheney? I mean, you know, for me, I'm kind of fine with any of those names. Cheney's the one that I know the least about. Uh, you know, between Tank and Lloyd, I think I'd be kind of okay with either one of those. But because Tank's the in-state guy and because he's such a bit of a fan favorite, that's a guy that I have, I guess, a little bit more of an affinity for, but it's only because of the fact that so many of our audience has that same affinity. Uh, Connor, you want to uh, crank down that music and uh, give us your thoughts on the top targets that you saw? Yeah, so uh, Keely Ringo has the long, been the longtime number one ranked player on this board, and I think you and I have sort of, let me not push back, but just wondered, you know, what that reasoning might yeah. be, uh, you know, given some of the more up gl glaring needs at tight end, even along the defensive line. Uh, 
when Eric Stokes and Tyson Campbell were both out with injury this past week, and you know, there's a chance Stokes, who is draft eligible, could leave at the, at the end of this year. I now really see why he has Ringo up there. Yeah. It, you know, they had to go to Tyreek McGee, who will be a um, who is a, a senior this year, so that it will be his last year. Now they do have Tyreek Stevenson, DJ Daniel, but that outside cornerback position, they are maybe a little bit thinner than you might think. Yeah. So if you can get a talent like Ringo and pair him with a guy like Jalen Kimber, I do sort of now see why Ringo is the number one target on Georgia's board. I think to speak on behalf of the fans here for a moment, I think Georgia fans would be more excited if it was another name, not because they don't love Ringo, because they think Ringo is coming. As guys climb this list, sometimes from the perspective of fans, that means that Georgia's getting in better position with, with players that a lot of fans feel like they know a little bit less about in terms of the status. Georgia fans, I think for the most part, and I would say with good reason, but I think for the most part feel really strongly about Keely Ringo coming uh, to Georgia eventually whenever that announcement mm-hmm. of, you know, finally does come. So therefore, it's almost like when we do this list every week, Georgia fans move off that top name and immediately start looking at the next names because fairly or unfairly, Ringo has become a chicken that Georgia fans are counting slightly before right. it has hatched. Right, and, and you know, well, I mean, there have been crazier things to happen. I'm sure we could come up with a long list yeah. of names who were longtime UGA guys or guys we thought would end up in Georgia's class who, you know, I mean, I believe this time a year ago, Jaden Hazelwood was still committed to Georgia, and we thought everything yeah. was hunky-dory there, and look how that all turned out. He's at Oklahoma, and Georgia now gets George Pickens. So, you know, recruiting, it's always very fluid, and, you know, as much as people might think Ringo, Ringo is coming here, it's not over till he's on campus. Yeah. Uh, Let me get one more comment here before we move on. Amos Williams says, Tank, when it comes to running backs, is the safer option. Evans may be a suspension waiting to happen. Well, you know, I know he's kind of dealt with some things reportedly taking place in his hometown there of Houston. I've said this before. You know, I think when you're a high schooler, when you're transitioning to college, I think that's a time to learn and grow and develop. I don't have a problem with Evans going through that process right now, however he might be doing it. So I haven't heard anything about Evans yet. It would scare me off him as a player. But Bigsby is also a guy that I very much like. And if I came on the air today and said, hey, guess what? Georgia just got a commitment from a Tank Bigsby. If I were to say that, I mean, the overwhelming majority of our audience would be thrilled about that mm-hmm. in the comment section. You would have a smattering of folks say, well, what does this mean about Zachary Evans? What went wrong there? But honestly, if we watched the scroll happen the day that did, it'd be mostly positive responses. So, Amos, I'm kind of a... a certainly in agreement with the first part of your comment that Bigsby certainly feels like a very safe option. It seems like you have a pretty good idea of what you're getting from him, which is a very good running back that seemingly uh, would be fond of playing at Georgia. However, I haven't heard anything yet from Evans that scares me off of him, that makes me think that he couldn't one day learn and grow and develop his way into being a very trustworthy and dependable college football player. You know, I'm very glad that not everything I ever did when I was 16 or 17 years old got the kind of national scrutiny that a five-star running back is going to get. And I know most of you, and Amos, you included, probably feel the uh, same way, but I'm just not that worried yet about any of the whatever rumors they are coming out of Houston when it comes to Evans. They don't really rise to the level of me being all that concerned about them yet. Mm-hmm. So if you take a look at uh, the top targets uh, also receiving votes and factor in Evans, you have five running backs on there. So it's, it's pretty clear Georgia – at least in the market for a second running back here. Let's say all of them tell you, B.A., we want to come to Georgia. Which one are you picking? Evans and Bigsby including the same group right now? All, you have your choice. You can only pick one. You get your choice of the five. I believe, I believe for now I'd probably still have to say Evans, but Bigsby is very close behind. And I don't necessarily know why Bigsby's ahead of Lloyd in my mind other than the fact that Location. Uh, all things being equal, I guess I'd just rather have a kid from Callaway High School. And, I, and I'm not telling you that that's the way that you should make up your mind. I'm not telling you should. I'm saying that, you know, emotional biases sometimes can be real. And all things being equal, the kid from Hogansville just seems like it'd be kind of a fun thing to have on the George roster. Uh, so for now, for me, it's still Evans. Bigsby's slightly behind. I'd love to hear, and maybe Jeff next week can kind of get into this, or maybe we bring in, you know, a running back and we do a real talk type thing. At some point in time, I'd love to hear people compare, you know, Lloyd and Bigsby as players. Evans as a player com- compares to them. Why Evans does rank so high. I mean, you know, the last time we saw Evans, at least the last time I remember seeing him, he wasn't playing particularly well against Katie, which is a pretty good program in the uh, in the state of Texas. 
but I'd love to hear a scout break down the comparison between these running backs, and it might help me form a more educated opinion. But for now, it's still Evans, just slightly. His speed certainly factors into that. Bigsby uh, slightly behind that, and the fact that he's from Georgia, but doing big things. I mean, it's not a guy that is, is, it shrinks on the football field. This is a big guy. It's a good performer. Uh, uh, Bigsby's probably my number two, and then after that, I guess it'll probably be uh, Lloyd my number three. Can I make a pitch for Marshawn Lloyd as your number one? A little under Is that right? Rocks. Okay, I'll listen to it. Um, so Lloyd from the D.C. area goes to Dematha, Dematha Catholic, Dematha Catholic, a powerhouse sort of in that area. Uh, he is a little bit quicker side to side, more of a lightning, if you will, to Kendall Milton's thunder. Whereas you know Big B, Bigsby probably just given his his body type and the way he plays and his measurables. Is, more thunder than lightning, uh, whereas I think Cheney, it, Cheney, and it, probably I'd include Evans as well as they're more, more those quicker, quicker running backs. So I, I that's why I kind of am leaning to Lloyd, but I'm also leaning to Lloyd because I think there's a more realistic scenario where Georgia might be able to flip him, where things continue to go south at South Carolina, and there's a coaching change there. Mm-hmm. And one final point, uh, Jeff has not started on his top 2021 targets yet. However, if and when he does. I believe that there's another prospect from Washington, that D.C. area there, mm. and Caleb Williams, who probably should be number one overall. Yeah. Uh, I do wonder, you know, Georgia already has a commitment from Mikhail Sherman, who's from that same sort of D.C. area. I yeah. do wonder if Georgia can sort of continue to establish that D.C. pipeline and how, you know, how landing Lloyd and landing uh, Sherman might affect Williams, who was at this Georgia game and was sitting front row to watch the light show Georgia win, everything you want to see there. I think that's a pretty good take all the way around. That's, that, that is definitely a very sensible opinion. Uh, Drew Iced said he'd definitely take Lloyd. This is on YouTube. Big CJ Everyday Brother says that UJ has been great at bringing in two totally different types of backs when they do bring in two running backs. I love Bigsby, but he's too much like Milton. That's an interesting uh, comment. Also going along with what Connor said a moment ago, we need to find a thunder to the Milton Lightning. Or maybe uh, said the opposite, maybe more of a lightning yeah. to Milton's thunder. But that's kind of an interesting point from uh, Big CJ there. Uh, G. Grace also talking about Arian Smith. We're going to talk about him a little bit more later on in our program. So it's Before the Edge is presented by program. Glad to have you with us. we got a lot more updates to come in terms of some of the stuff that's been out there on social media as of late. I'll also remind you that it is flu season coming up, and Kroger's got you covered. When it comes to that, you can get your flu vaccination there. The great news is there's no appointment needed. And the even better news is, in some cases, you can get a copay for as low as $0. You can learn more at Kroger.com slash flu. Kroger.com slash flu. So a lot of folks in the comment section talking about Arian Smith. We will get into him later on. We'll have a little bit more from Kendall Milton's family from the weekend, too. So we are busy coming up, but on Before the Hedges presented by Kroger, it really wouldn't be Before the Hedges if Jeff Sintel wasn't here. So let's let you hear from him right now. Hey, Dog Nation, Brandon Adams here with Jeff Sintel. It's part of Before the Head, just presented by Kroger. Uh, Jeff taking a little vacation this week, so we wanted to kind of dive in and uh, do a little recruiting talk with him to recap and reevaluate what was a very busy weekend for Georgia this past Saturday against Notre Dame. And I guess let me start with this, Jeff. I, I said this on our Palo Window postgame show on Saturday night, and I've probably said this in some form or fashion a dozen or so times since then. I've been going to Sanford Stadium my entire life. There have been some very special atmospheres that I've been lucky enough to be a part of. I believe I'm not a prisoner of the moment, though, for saying that this was, whether it be the light show, whether it be just the overall intensity of the crowd, even before the lights got cranked up, this was the best I've seen. And I know what it did to the Irish on the field that night. I can only imagine how it potentially could have helped Georgia and the recruiting trail as well, because the show that I enjoyed, I imagine the younger fans enjoyed it. Even, I mean, by younger fans, I mean recruits. <laughs> I imagine they enjoyed it even more. Yeah, I would say that was, we, we kind of covered this on Dog Nation earlier this week with a post. We try to jam a lot of a lot of glowing reviews in there and Brandon a lot of them were glowing and they were positive they were red you saw words like unbelievable perhaps one of the best ones were was when um, I think the father of uh, Quay Robinson said uh, Quay Robinson the father of Justin Robinson said his son was telling him about it and he said he thought he was at a party yeah. and then a football game broke yeah. out and I mean there are lots of good stuff in there I, I think um, First of all, to hear you say that in the in that post game so show, BA was a very happy BA after that game, and for him who's got such a thorough knowledge of the Georgia program, to call that the the most you know 
good, you know, most good vibes, most, you know, internal joy you've ever had. That's saying quite a lot. And all those, all those, all those recruits that were there, all those big timers that were there, you saw Carson Beck, you saw Theo Johnson and Darnell Washington on the front row. The other front row had five-star junior quarterback Caleb Williams. Very packed house with a lot of everything from four stars to five stars everywhere in between. And most left that feeling, left that game with a certain undescribable feeling. They, Brandon, they talked about one underrated aspect of it, man, was the Jets flying over oh, yeah. was actually something that really registered in their wheelbase as well. Yeah, honestly, when you have a chance for those flyovers, it's always a, a really cool thing to be able to see. And I ask you this question more seriously than kidding, although I guess there's part of it's tongue-in-cheek about this. I've seen some Alabama fans online upset about the fact that Georgia got a chance to show off its laser light display before Alabama, who's got the same kind of lighting system, or at least a very similar lighting system, installed in Bryant-Denny Stadium. Georgia got to show its before Alabama's got to show its, and Alabama not even really sure when it's going to have a night game right now because Alabama LSU, which normally is one, CBS chose Georgia Notre Dame over that for this year. So I say mostly serious, although I guess half kidding, how good is it for Georgia in comparison to Alabama that they got to show off its little twinkly lights before Alabama got a chance to do it? Well, <laughs> show it and do it. I think the main thing there, Brandon, is maybe that says something about out-of-conference scheduling and making sure you have a marquee opponent lined up like Georgia did. Um, th- that atmosphere, Brandon, I-, I talked to so many recruits already, and they're basically saying uh, something to the extent of how great it would be just to run out of that tunnel. Mm-hmm. First of all, I don't think folks realize when they see that, that the, the, the steam and the fog, it's fog when they come out of that tunnel from the smoke machine, I guess we'd call it. Mm-hmm. That stuff's actually pretty cold. If it ever hits your skin, it's a little chilly, but they see yeah, it's the- it's probably dry ice is what it is. The, yeah, the chemist over here, but you see a lot, of, a lot of the recruits, they're like, just to be, when that's going on, to run out of that tunnel, what a joy it would be yeah. to play in front of the love, in front of that crowd. And, that's something that struck a chord with a lot of those potential Georgia players in the house there. And it seems, it seems like the simplest thing to say is all the boys that saw that, that walked away from that atmosphere, they could not feel impressed anywhere from impressed, overjoyed, to floored, mm-hmm. to grateful if they get a chance to play between the hedges one so day. to get down to brass tacks here for a moment though what a lot of uga fans want to know is how timelines now get altered by this who gets sped up who maybe gets off the fence about being undecided maybe commits to the g so to speak how does what happened on saturday impact georgia's 2020 class and we'll get to the 2021 stuff in a moment but in terms of the 2020 class how does this impact 2020 yeah i think this is one of those things it's really interesting the way you got to phrase it right now because I think the term accelerated timelines kind of makes a lot of sense right here. There were a lot of guys in the 2019 class that a certain point of their recruitment, they were done. They were going to go to Georgia and they were just kind of going to play out the rest of the round in order to take their official visits. And the interesting thing we're going to watch and monitor here is who accelerates their timeline from, I want to take all my visits, I want, I want to do it in an All-American game, to I think I see what I need to see. I don't need to keep looking anymore. Do you think someone may have done that on the basis of I Saturday think there night? is a strong possibility that it happened. I think there's situations where some folks that weren't even at that game, Brandon, were watching what was going on inside Sanford Stadium, and that might have been the final, final mechanism for them to make a move. I think it's going to gain a lot of traction within the 2021 class for certain. But you got to remember, those key official visits, let's – let, let's, let's, I don't know if we've ever mentioned this on the program yet, but somehow E.J. Smith, the son of Emmett yeah. Smith, is there at Georgia uh, on an official visit, probably a, a teed-up opportunity for you to get in a couple Florida jokes or whatever, and it is a non-starter. It is not a story to watch. But the ones to watch, Noah Sewell has the great experience, the visit, everything else on Saturday, then plays paintball with core members of the Georgia defense on Sunday, Tay Crowder, DJ Daniel, Nate McBride, a lot of the guys he wanted to play with. And listen in close, Savvy Dog Nation readers. That was the one thing that Noah Sewell needed to see. He needed to see the bond and the kinship and the brotherhood. He needed to feel that and also kind of take a lap around the experience there for Dog Nation inside Sanford Stadium. So I think those two boxes got checked very strongly for a guy like Noah Sewell. Now you got to look at a Theo Johnson. He was supposed to take a lot of his visits. He had a very regimented plan to take a lot of his visits afterward. He wanted to see Iowa. He wanted to see um, Michigan. He wanted to see 
Penn State. He wanted to see Alabama for a potential last visit. I think what's going through the mind of a guy like a guy like Theo Johnson right now is, okay, how much of an impact did that visit make? And then do I still want to go through all the rest of it just to be sure, just to make certain that that's these other trips are what I want to see. I want to make sure that you know, the, the high, one thing Theo's always told me is he always feels great after a visit. He feels like anywhere he goes, oh, that's where I need to go. Now he needs to make sure that the feelings that he acquired from Athens in that visit, they stay with him for a while. And it is a lasting memory of how, how fun it was to be in, inside Sanford Stadium. But one takeaway, Brandon, when you see all these guys, they got their phones out, man. Mm -hmm. They're recording it, they're capturing it because they want to remember what that feels like. Uh, two or three days down the road, a week down the road, and also share it with everybody across social media right now. So a couple things you bring up there. The Noah Sewell thing is really interesting, and I said this to you a few times last week, whether it be on Dog Nation Daily or here on Before the Hedges presented by Kroger, that because Sewell is way out there in Utah, this is if you're going to invite him to come to Georgia, you're asking him to you know, go almost entirely across the North American landmass to uh, come here and go to school, it means relationships are going to be really important. And I know that Noah has talked a lot about wanting to play in the SEC, or at least strongly hinted that playing in the SEC is a big factor for him. But I told you last week that I didn't know if the atmosphere was going to be a big, as big a deal to him as the relationships that he's forming with Glenn Schumann and some of the other linebackers in this roster right now. And here you tell the story about the, the paintball. That seems like exactly like what I would assume that Sewell would want. Can I be friends with these guys? You know, my brother's at Oregon. I could go there. I already know that school really well or, you know, something, you know, out west. I, you know, familiar, comfortable with that. Obviously, looking at some of these other SEC schools as well. Is this the one where I can make friends? Is this the one where I'm going to feel like I have the parents even? You know, uh, we've heard from them before. I think I'd be able to put their trust in Glenn Schumann and Kirby Smart and Dan Lanning and say, hey, you've got my son for the next three to four years. I've always felt like relationships are more important with Sewell than maybe any other fa factor in his recruiting. It sounds like he's really forming those bonds right now. Yeah, he's, he's never struck me, Brandon, as a fickle, uh, a distracted, show me your shiny things, let me, let me do some dangling keys, a favorite Brandon Adams term right there. I never think, I've never thought that Noah Sewell was about that. I would probably just as much, I would probably dismiss as much as I can any notions or any fears that people have that the Noah Sewell decision will be decided by location, mm -hmm. crossing you know the, the the North American content. I don't think that's an issue for Noah at all. He has always struck me from when I first start, started talking to him and his father, Gabriel Sewer Sr. He is a explorer. He's a guy that wants to set the curve. He doesn't want to be a guy that kind of follows what his brother did or go find his brother. If you look at all the Sewell brothers, one was at Oregon, one's at Nevada, one's at Utah. They, they kind of went their own separate ways. Of course, Panay Sewell is the future likely first rounder at offensive tackle. But I get the feeling that Georgia, where it stands with Noah Sewell, I can't imagine them, them trying to launch the ball out of the park are doing any better right now with Noah Sewell than they currently are. There is some interesting developments involving George and a 2020 quarterback. We'll talk about that coming up in just a moment. Before that, though, you mentioned Theo Johnson a moment ago, and I wanted to follow up with this with another 2020 quarterback in mind. Alabama has tried to come on strong with Johnson as of late. Alabama also got a flip from USC. Bryce Young, a five-star quarterback, has flipped to the Alabama Crimson Tide. Quarterbacks can be Pied Pipers in recruiting oftentimes. They have coattails. The other recruits seemingly want to follow. Alabama had not had a 2020 quarterback recruit. Now they have one. Does that impact Theo Johnson? I'm assuming it could have an impact on a guy like a Rick Gilbert, who we don't talk about as much as we used to. Mm -hmm. But for um, for these guys that are considering Georgia and Alabama, Theo Johnson in particular, does the presence now of a five-star quarterback at Alabama make the Crimson Tide more enticing? Makes the Crimson Tide more enticing for a lot of folks. I would think that uh, – you know, a guy like uh, Arian Smith, I mean, the very fast, speedy receiver out of Florida, that's a guy to start thinking about as well with, with what Alabama can draw in now. Because, folks, hard to believe the Crimson Tide didn't have a 2020 anchor quarterback commitment. And now they got one that's been committed to Southern Cal for the longest time, a true five-star, really heady kid, kind of reminds you a lot of the Tua Tango Vailoa type player that they've had recently. And it's funny, the misfortunes this year of Southern Cal, mm -hmm. they lose a JT Daniels. Yeah. It shows another freshman gets a chance to play and show how well he can play. And then that starts opening up the window for, for Alabama with a, Bryce Young, with a Bryce Young flip. And that's exactly what happens now. And I know folks don't want to hear it, but Alabama some, suddenly becomes a bigger 
entity in the class of 2020 because I don't feel they had their next successor to Tua Tango Bailoa yet, not even his younger brother or, uh, in, in their program right now as far as the depth chart goes. So you got to watch Alabama now as well with that they suddenly, after losing Carson Beck, remember Carson Beck was committed to Alabama. Right. Dan Enos moves away. His offensive coordinator, Mike Loxley, moves away. And suddenly, you know, Carson Beck didn't really know anybody at Alabama anymore. And that's what caused him to open up his decision that eventually led him to Georgia. Well, speaking of Carson Beck, he is a 2020 UGA quarterback commit. And yet, sounds like this week we're paying attention to another name from the 2020 class, the quarterback position. What's up with that? Yeah, first of all, it's another Jaden for you to get used to. Jaden Delora. He's out of Hawaii, another, I guess, player at St. Louis High School. That's some of the same quarterback roots where Tuatanga Vailoa came out in the state of Hawaii. Only a three star, Brandon. Uh, 6'1, 190, but he's got some great stats so far. He tells me that Georgia's been knocking on his door for a long while now, trying to recruit him. He has very uh, high level of appreciation for the Georgia program, the Georgia tradition doesn't have an offer yet. His biggest offers now are uh, San Diego State mm -hmm. and Hawaii. So naturally, first question you want to ask is, Georgia, with numbers so tight, what are yeah. they doing there with a 2020 quarterback? Think about this. The better Jake Fromm plays in 2019, the more likely it means that he goes to the NFL. All of a sudden, you're down one quarterback. Uh, Dwan Mathis, what does his health prognosis look like? Is he going to come back? Is he going to be ready to play this year? or next year, all of a sudden it now means that Georgia has to start thinking about the future of that position. I know we talk about 2021 quarterbacks and 2022 quarterbacks. Georgia still needs to have not enough bodies and arms in camp to practice, have guys ready for spring practice. Stetson Bennett, you know, he's just a redshirt sophomore as well. Everyone talks about Georgia. They're going to get in the graduate transfer market for a quarterback should Jake Fromm go pro after his junior season. All of a sudden, the quarterback position, even in a very tight, thrifty, efficient cycle for Georgia in 2020, it's also one to monitor now. The other thing that's going to come up here, and honestly compels me to admit, you know, the forum, forum.dognation.com has talked about this. Probably a less talented team than Beck played on a year ago, but the stats so far for Beck in his senior year, maybe not quite what some would hope they would have been. I'm not watching every single snap. I'm just seeing some of the conjecture that comes out of this from folks who do enjoy watching this as close as the internet will allow you to, is the presence of another 2020 quarterback on the rumor mill, is that some sort of rebuke of Beck? I don't think so. I think it's just numbers and bodies because if you look at what Beck did a year ago, that's what he did in the biggest stage in Florida high school football. I think some of the stats that are coming out uh, I think Beck has 20 rushes on the year for Mandarin High School, but only one of those was a direct uh, a run call for him. And, folks, he simply doesn't have all the King's horses and all the King's men. I don't think he has the blocks. I don't think he has the receivers. He doesn't have the speed that he did a year, did a year ago. And really, Carson made it work with a lot of just simple 1AA type talents at receiver, one or two of those, not a whole lot of those. And that was actually his first year uh, playing varsity football, and he ended up winning Florida's Mr. Football Award. Mm -hmm. You can't discount that. You talk to Beck now, you talk to the people that train him and work with him, and they think this is a big year for him for leadership and yeah. trying to make sure you can, do, you can only do what you do there under center. He feels and they feel he's light years ahead of the quarterback he was at this time a year ago. It's just that you don't have the pieces around him to show it. Um, on a game-to-game -game basis down there in Florida. Certainly he was center stage on Saturday working as a recruiter for Georgia with guys like Darnell Washington, Theo Johnson, and others on campus. So that's a story worth paying attention to. Speaking of visitors, though, in Athens on Saturday, this one to me is a very intriguing storyline. Heavens knows we have talked a lot about uh, Zachary Evans, the five-star running back. What's up with him? What's going on? The tweet uh, from Friday obviously adds to that intrigue when he says he's 100% uh, made up his mind about what he wants to do, although not revealing more details other than just hinting at that. And then on Saturday, uh, Auburn commit Tank Bigsby, four-star running back at a Callaway High School down in Hogansville, Georgia. He showed up, as you reported in our forum at forum.dognation.com, he showed up at UGA for the Georgia Notre Dame game on Saturday. Auburn fans probably had to raise a couple of eyebrows at that, given the fact that Georgia flipped George Pickens from Auburn a year ago. What do you make of this? Yeah, that's very interesting. First of all, let's always make sure we have matters of records right. We didn't write a story about it, but on the forum we had put out there that we thought Jordan Birch was in town. Jordan Birch was not in town. 
we didn't get some reliable sourcing on that one. What we did have reliable sourcing on was uh, Tank Bigsby in Athens. It was kind of maybe planted that seed that I got to watch out for, and then he made it to Athens. It's no secret that Tank has liked Georgia and thought about playing Georgia for quite some time. There's been some, you know, I guess we call off and on, hot and cold yeah. with Georgia and Tank Bigsby. I think that's fair to say. Um, and get this, Brandon. He was actually dinged up a little bit on Friday night uh, in a game for Callaway's game, mm-hmm. but actually still made it between the hedges in Athens to check out Georgia wow. again. That says a lot about running back and, and where Georgia's at and how they're kind of going to turn over every rock to make sure they got the right piece for their running back class in 2020. You've seen the, you know, Dell McGee makes a trip out to South Florida to check out John Chaney Jr. There's also Rashad Johnson in New Orleans. That's Cedric Von Prahn's teammate. There's also Rashad and Lloyd. So there's a lot of names there that Georgia's still looking for. And don't forget this. I don't think it's just Georgia that are going to be trying to chip away at Auburn and Tank Bigsby. Mm. I think a school like Ohio State's going to keep coming in. After they had some uh, disappointing running back news a couple of months ago, they've been kind of trying to pivot after losing out on a couple backs they thought they were getting. Yeah, and Twice then, in the same week they lost a running back. And then Georgia has still kind of maintained that they're, they're still recruiting Tank. They still want to make sure that they're keeping that fire burning there for Tank Bigsby as well. And you know, with all the 2020 running back stuff, we also have to mention that Kendall Milton was back in town for 2020, another visit, had a 24-hour visit. He Somehow he's told me that every time he comes to Georgia, Georgia seems to one-up everything that they've done for him and his family and just how excited he is to be a Bulldog one day. You kind of saw him take over a maybe a caretaker or a more of a connected, committed recruit in this class, reaching out to others, talking to others, and kind of doing the things that a guy that is a 100% stone-cold lead pipe, lead pipe lock to Georgia to be able to do. And uh, it's kind of interesting how Georgia, we've said this for the longest time, Georgia's got the five-star back yeah. in the class, kind of the cornerstone running back commitment. So it allows them to play the long game with a lot of these guys yeah. and see how it fits in. And for Mr. Evans, he, did, he was in Texas A&M. He was in College Station on Saturday. Um, I guess the uh, plot will continue to thicken and unravel. With we that. haven't heard you weigh in too much on what you thought Evans might have m- meant or if it's what people assume that he meant, that he's chosen between a school. If that in his mind is binding, I mean, one way or another, what did you make of Evans tweeting on Friday that he had decided his college choice without really revealing, revealing more details than that. What did you make of that? I think he's had the choice known for a long time. You do? I think he's had the choice in mind for a long time. He's just had other things right now that have taken front and center stage for him. And man, this kid, this young man, you know, he's just a young man. I'm not going to come down too hard on him because kids will do um, back and forth things on social media. Him saying I've decided that might mean anywhere from, well, I won't speculate. I'm just going to say that I'm not putting in stock into anything that's happening on Twitter right now is a matter of record for him making anything up or making anything determined. Um, it, it could have been I've decided to go to Texas A&M this weekend or I've decided to have a pimento and cheese sandwich for lunch, anything else like that. or. You know, Do you think the fact that Bigsby was here on Saturday means it's now, even if it's by only a small degree, less likely that uh, that uh, Evans comes to Georgia? Does the pre- presence of Bigsby mean that much in comparison to what may or may not happen with Evans? I just think it's a back that Georgia is continuing to monitor and evaluate. The interesting thing to see with Zachary Evans, I think a lot of people are looking at this, is he didn't play for two games and then his high school team had an off week. So does that mean that um, Zachary Evans uh, is back? Is he working his way back through some adversity? I think the first step on Zachary Evans, you know, getting back into good form in all phases of his life, including potential where he could commit to, I think that comes with just what you see there on the monitors next to us in that split screen. Just play football, just make those runs. Just remind everybody why you're such a special talent in the class of 2020 and handle this bump in the road the right way. And I think that will be more impressive and better for his future in the long run. A couple minutes here. Let me talk about a couple other things with you. Obviously, Caleb Williams is the big 2021 quarterback name that a lot of Georgia fans have been interested in. My understanding is he was in town Saturday for the Georgia Notre Dame game. What can you tell us about Williams right now and the current state? of affairs when it comes to the 2021 class. Yeah, Caleb was in town. He was on on the front row on the non-official visitors, uh, I guess, field box in the west end zone. Uh, his dad so was- So they separate the nines and the officials? Yeah, and they've got certain spacing. I think on the, 
on one side, which was the Georgia home sideline uh, side, you had the front row of Carson Beck, uh, Darnell Washington, Theo Johnson, Darnell's assistant coach, D.L. Hill out of Desert Pines, Theo's younger brother. Uh, one row beyond that, I think you started to see No Sewell and his family. They had some reserve seating, I guess, front and center inside Sanford. And then on the other, other section, you had Caleb Williams and his family taking up a front row seat on the visitor's mm -hmm. side. I'm going visitor's side. That's the, the side of the goalpost sure. closest to the visitor's side. You saw him. He's been to Georgia, I think, six or seven times now. He's told me a couple clear takeaways. I want to just get right to the point on that. Number one, all you really needed to see was the environment, the atmosphere. Wanted to see like a, what a game day looked like. Obviously, he was very impressed with that. He called the atmosphere electric. Very impressive to see. The second thing which is I think a lot of those quarterback years are starting to look at is he actually thought Georgia was very efficient in the way they took deep shots down the field. Oh, good to hear. They moved the ball, uh, especially when they threw those back shoulder fades to Lawrence Cager. That was one of the biggest takeaways for Caleb Williams as he continues to seriously consider Georgia. How about the 2021 class overall? How big of a day was this for 2021 overall? I think that's one of the things that we're going to look back at. and Maybe the overview statement I meant to say about our whole discussion today on the Notre Dame win and the showcase venue it was for recruits is I think 2021. For the 2021 class and going forward, I think the Notre Dame game can be a vehicle for decisions much like 93K Day was for Kirby Smart's first spring game in Georgia when a lot of the 2017 and 2018 guys made up their mind that they were going to be Bulldogs. They just waited to share that news with everyone else on their own kind of specific news cycle and timelines. You saw Barrett Carter, the big time inside linebacker, outside linebacker hybrid out of North Gwinnett. He was thrilled to be there again in Georgia and Athens. He looked quite at home. He said he felt quite at home. He said he will 100% be back. Amarius Mims, the big tackle. He said it was another amazing time, great as usual between the hedges. Terrence Ferguson, another hybrid offensive line guard tackle prospect. He had some lengthy comments that we have up on dognation.com about how electric and how the streets were just flooded at 11 a.m. with things going on. Keep going down the list there, you've got um, Micah Morris was also there in town. Uh, you've got Deion Colsey in town. I mean, just a lot of those 2021 targets. Jaden Thomas was there, said it was great as yeah. usual. Um, lots of folks walked away from that venue and that game. Highly impressed. And you know, one of the neatest things, Brandon, I want to make sure we get into this on our segment today, is afterwards some of those recruits got to go into the locker room afterward and kind of celebrate and have oh, that that's nice. have that yeet moment um, with Kirby Smart. That's nice. You know, everybody saw the video, I think, on Twitter. We all remember our first yeet. Everybody remembers that first yeet inside Sanford. Well, Kirby Smart came back from, I think, his press sessions, and he said, man, it's been a while since I, get to, I got to see you guys. Turned up the music, and everybody started dancing. And it was neat how some of the recruits have told me that the players just kind of bonded with them that's and good. welcomed them in. Some guys were getting gang tackled. Some guys were saying, you know, you, we want you to be a part of this, too. And that's a that's just a great you know kind of final that's bottom good. line moment. That's how, really nice. You know, everybody wants that atmosphere and kinship. And after that big win, uh, the recruits on town were were kind of meant to feel allowed to feel very special and already a part of the family, even though they'd yet to make their college decisions. Last thing for you, how about who's not there and kind of what that means for some of these guys going forward? Yeah, biggest names that weren't there. You didn't see Keely Ringo there. Uh, I didn't see James Williams, the five-star safety okay. out of the 2021 class. Uh, Keely Ringo is another guy that's going to probably come to Athens after the season. It'll be interesting to see if he makes an unofficial visit for the Texas A&M game. That's another game I think recruits are starting to think about whether or not they can make. Um, Chad Lingberg, their committed tackle, guard tackle hybrid out of the 2020 class, is, that's the game he's going to attend. Nice. Um, Jordan Birch was not there, as we discussed early in this segment. Um, I still feel Georgia is making the right moves there with Jordan Birch, where they're going to be in a good spot uh, towards the end of his decision timeline whenever that, that comes. Right? I think Georgia's doing what it needs to do to kind of stay in that race with Clemson, South Carolina. Lots of folks in the forum have already weighing in on they think that, you know, Jordan Birch and Georgia seems like the sparks are heating up okay. right there. Um, so they have their own information on that. But lots of five stars in this class. Where is Georgia going to close out with? What numbers? I think the quarterback situation makes a lot of sense, um, or at least it's an interesting thought to think about what's happening on the defensive line, what's going to happen with the, the defensive backs class going forward. But, folks, these clips 
and that red light night uh, in Sanford Stadium for the Notre Dame win, that's going to have some reverb all across social media and college football. And a lot of folks now, I think, when they go inside Sanford Stadium, and it's not a night game, somehow the face value on that ticket is going to feel a little bit less when they don't get to see one of those heartfelt best ever BA moments. Uh, having a true, true BA big time moment inside Sanford Stadium. And I think that Notre Dame game, the recruiting, the perfect storm of everything that's going on, the, the new recruiting venues, the new West End Zone Lounge, the new ribbon lighting, the new Krypton fanfare. Georgia just keeps seemingly stacking itself one on top of another. And when they get the recruits on the field and they play the way they do, and they, this, these players and these boys see the players play so hard, one of the recruits told me, it's like, man, you just don't want to let all those folks down that go crazy for you and flip on their cell phones and cheer for you so loud. That's what's building right now at the University of Georgia. That's great stuff, Jeff. We'll let you enjoy a little time off. We appreciate you giving us this update on recruiting before you go. And, of course, to keep up with everything happening with UGA recruiting, it's forum.dognation.com to find out about all the latest rumors and kind of up-to-the-minute stuff that's happening. And of course, dognation.com as well. Jeff's already got some great stuff up coming back to the weekend. And you can make sure you check that out at dognation.com. And we'll see Jeff here live back here on Before the Hedge is presented by Kroger again next Wednesday at 3 p.m. Jeff, thanks so much for your time. And we got plenty more Before the Hedge is presented by Kroger coming up. Really good stuff there from Jeff Sintel, of course. Uh, not able to be with us here today for our show, but good enough to tape a pretty extended interview. And I hope you enjoyed that. As a part of Before the Hedge is presented by Kroger. Hey, y'all, I'm Brandon Adams. Speaking of Kroger, let me remind you about one great deal they've got going on. You can find savory ideas for the whole family at Kroger.com slash what's for dinner. You can start planning family meals today. Weeks worth of meals. Uh, you can load up on your items directly into your cart for pickup or delivery. And also, don't forget to look at those coupons, too. So really good stuff there from your local Kroger. We will get a lot more of your comments before we're done as part of our hurry up. Uh, we'll give you more of a chance to react. Let me hit a few more pieces of news kind of before we get there, both looking back on the weekend that was for Georgia recruiting and looking at a couple of the things that are going on here right now. We talked about Chris Milton, Kendall Milton's father off the top of the program, maybe reaching out to four-star tight end Theo Johnson, encouraging him to commit to the G. Well, Milton's mom apparently also had a, a great weekend here in Athens, too. The entire family in for the Georgia-Notre Dame game on Saturday. I like this line from her. Great picture, by the way. Sanford Stadium before nightfall, looking beautiful there. Uh, Mrs. Milton writes, it was the fastest turnaround trip ever, but well worth it. On the ground for less than 24 hours. The UGA fan base, she says, is amazing. So sorry we didn't get a chance to visit more with Dog Nation, but love seeing y'all and look forward to seeing y'all again real soon. That's good stuff there from uh, from uh, Kendall Milton's mom having a great time there in Athens this past weekend. Also, someone else was having a really good time in Athens was the UGA commit alongside the defensive line, Nazir Stackhouse. I liked this little video that he shared of himself, having a good time, walking around, enjoying himself there in the environment that was Sanford Stadium. You like to be able to see that, and, and you know what you see from Stackhouse there is so representative of what so many guys were kind of showing off. You can see a lot of the phones even behind over the shoulder of Stackhouse as they're walking in, taking all that in. I think we all had our phones up. I mean, the student section was in place well before an hour before game time, and I think everybody kind of wanted to soak that up a little bit. Also, you may have heard a name for the first time today, Jaden DeLora, the quarterback out of Hawaii. The Georgia's apparently recruiting a little bit right now as a 2020 prospect. Wanted to give you a little video taste of him, kind of what he brings to the table as a player. Uh, DeLora himself tweeted this out, probably one of the biggest games I'll ever play in. So you get a chance to kind of see some of those highlights. If you want to visit uh, at Jaden underscore DeLora on Twitter, you can see a little bit more of what he's bringing to the table. Does Georgia need a second quarterback for the class of 2020? I guess given the uh, limited number of scholarships available for the class, there may be some debate about that. But uh, Delara, based on those highlights, certainly looks like a pretty impressive player. You can check out more of his own highlights there on Twitter, the young man from Hawaii. And then before we hear more of your comments, let me mention this here as well because we've had several people mentioning What's the latest on Arian Smith, the uh, wide receiver prospect that Georgia has been kind of involved with? Uh, you heard Jeff Sintel in the interview with him a moment ago. The presence of Bryce Young now as an Alabama commit gives the Crimson Tide maybe the potential opportunity to go out and reach out to more wide receivers, maybe Smith included. There was also another interesting shoe to drop when it comes to Smith's recruitment this week as his own high school lets it be known. 
Uh, Lakeland Football there says congratulations to 2020 wide receiver Arian Smith on getting an offer from the defending national champion Clemson. So Clemson now in on Arian Smith too. This is a speedy receiver. Georgia, who right now has a pretty good crop of big receivers, guys that can go get the football and guys that use their body well. Maybe in the 2020 class, Georgia looking to supplement its speed a bit more. Corey Wren brings some of that to the table. Certainly, Arian Smith would potentially bring some of that to the table, but it sounds like based on Jeff, his thoughts about Alabama, based on that tweet from Lakeland down in Florida when it comes to, when it comes to Clemson, that there's a lot more competition for Arian Smith right now. Gives you an idea of how valued he is as a player, and I guess one of the things we'll look forward to hearing from Jeff coming up in the days ahead is where Georgia might factor into that recruitment with potentially Alabama coming on and now Clemson heavily involved too. I know that Jeff has said in the past, watch out for Clemson. Were they to extend an offer? Well, Clemson's done that now, so we'll see where it goes from here. With that said, let's go hurry up. We don't have time for a ton of comments because we've got some other stuff going on here around the Dog Nation uh, World Headquarters Studios today, but we can take a few. Your questions, comments, your thoughts on UGA recruiting, we'll try to knock out as many as we can. Tram Dog says, stack the quarterback room. The transfer portal is real, so he likes the idea of bringing as many quarterbacks as possible, and I think one way or another, no matter how many quarterbacks Georgia signs for the class of 2020, taking a look at that transfer portal, I think it'll be something that Georgia probably does there too as well. Uh, Tal Whitaker says, any uh, date set for future recruits to commit? I mean, obviously dog fans have been on pins and needle for a while. Some of that goes back to the stuff involving uh, uh, you know, Zachary Evans a couple of weeks ago when supposedly he was maybe about to commit. Some Georgia fans were ready for that. Now you've got the aftermath of the big visit weekend this past weekend. I guess this is one of those things where Georgia fans kind of always stay on watch for that, and you may have to wait just a little bit longer. And Connor, if you want to hop in here and join us for some comments, I'd lo- certainly love to have you as a part of that too. Green Soldier says he thinks we're going to land a killer grad transfer student when it comes to the quarterback uh, position, and you may be right about that. I'll pop over and say some stuff on Facebook here, too. Uh, Drew Roman says, what about flipping someone from Clemson, whether it be DJ Uyunglele or Miles Murphy or anyone else? Listen, this is as much of a compliment as you'll hear me give a Georgia rival probably on any of the shows that I do. Clemson's, uh, Clemson's just created a scenario where it's very difficult to flip players who are committed to them. They don't recruit very many guys. As you see right now, they're just now offering Arian Smith. They're pretty careful about what they do, and because of that, they are difficult to flip from. It's just a different strategy than what Georgia employs. You know, Georgia's a lot more like Alabama. Alabama's a lot more like Georgia. They're very aggressive. They go after more prospects, and they seemingly recruit guys simultaneously for the same spot. That's what you want to do sometimes if you want to sign the best 25. Clemson does things a little different from that, and while you may run the risk of not being involved for some players you'd like to be in on, when you do get in on them, it seems like they're a lot more hesitant to want to flip. And, Connor, I'm guessing you'll agree with me that flipping a Clemson player is not an easy task it's happened, when it comes to recruiting. Clemson has had one prospect in its last three recruiting classes decommit and end up going somewhere else. Yeah. They just when they, when they recruit you and you commit to them, in this new sort of era, it is, it is truly a marriage. You are with them and they are with you until the end. Jacob O'Neill says, what are my thoughts on Julio Tehran? I, I guess we'll save the Braves talk for another time, although there are certainly some concerns there. Chris Branham says, B.A., who can we get uh, replaced from with before the Tennessee game? Uh, oh, come on, Chris. Come on, come on, come on. He says, I think he's having a little fun pulling some, pulling some legs there. Um, Clint Haynes says, will we play in more night games after last Saturday? Seems like a no-brainer. And Connor, I said that this morning as part of our uh, Dog Nation Daily comment section. That my fear is, as much as I love the atmosphere on Saturday, that because it was so cool that day games now become an even tougher sell for fans and recruits alike of once you find out that so-and-so game's a day game, I think it's now going to be even harder to sell that knowing just how stark the comparison between the two environments is. Right, and you know, now one thing to counteract that, though, is you know, when you get those October and November home games going forward, which in the future yeah. likely to be, you know, Tennessee will be a November game now, you know, Georgia Tech, maybe one day if they ever figure out what to do with that program, that game will move to a night game. When those games kick off at 3.30, in that time of the year, it's, it's getting dark out by the time that fourth That's quarter starts. So as long as the sun is like reasonably down, I think Georgia fans are going to find a reason to light up Sanford. So it's really, you know, you just don't want those noon kickoff games in September, early October, and people don't want those anyway to begin with. I don't think the light, I don't know how much the light show might change that. I should apologize to Chris Branham, who was having some fun in our comment section. I set him up 
Tua look like a uh, an evil doer, which is not was not my intention at all on that. Let me finish with this though. Uh, Drew Roman, good question. More likely to come to Georgia, a Rick Gilbert, current Florida commit Javon Dexter. Now Jeff moved Dexter down the list a little bit this week, but I would I guess at this stage I'd still say that Dexter is probably more likely than a Rick Gilbert is. I'm going to make you answer the question for me. So you feel pretty comfortable that Darnell Washington's coming here, right? feel pretty good about that. You feel pretty good Theo Johnson's coming here, right? I feel pretty good about that. I should tell you what, what I tend to think yeah. about where Mr. Rick Gilbert might be going. Yeah, I think that Georgia's done its work there. I, you know, I don't know what's up with Javon Dexter. That's obviously a player that I do like, but I would say that he's probably more likely than Gilbert here at the moment. Uh, Quentin Truitt on the subject of the team itself asked a pretty good question. What happens to Blaylock snaps once Karis Jackson is back? It's going to be a competition, you know. Uh, I mean, Karis has obviously earned himself some early playing time in that Vanderbilt game, and that's going to be a competition. I think that Blaylock, one of the things that he does so well, and I want to turn this into a team you know, conversation because we end up doing this for all day long, but, you know, he runs after the catch so well. Go back and look at that game against Ar- Arkansas State. It's a five-yard out. He turns into a, you know, a huge run after catch gain. He does that really well. That's going to make it hard to keep him off the field, but. But, you know, he and Kyrus are competing not just for the, some of the some, same reps at wide receiver, but at punt returner there as well. Before the season, I said uh, I made a bold prediction that Dominic Blaylock would be Georgia's leading receiver mm-hmm. this year. Through, three, through four games, excuse me, do you know who Georgia's leading receiver is? Oh, uh, who is that? It would be Dominic Blaylock. Oh, good job. That's nice. Good See, job. I, I, I wanted to be at the end of the season, but, you know, so far I, I think he's shown – uh, he's a guy who's a little bit capable of more. Uh, played re- obviously really well in that Arkansas State game. Impressed as a receiver, sort of in that Notre Dame game. You know, there was one pass where he and Fromm couldn't quite hook up. It was a a, a, a tough throw for Fromm to make, and he sort of left it a little short. But you know, I, I think the future is bright for Fromm and Kier and Kieris, Tyler. Mm-hmm. Demetrius Robertson, Blaylock, those guys are all going to be competing for the same sort of reps and snaps, and it'll be interesting to see how Georgia sort of balances those guys going forward. Uh, Joel Moody's got a pretty interesting list of what he thinks the quote-unquote silent commits are. Uh, looks like a pretty good list to me right now. Uh, some of y'all over here on YouTube are going to get us talking about regular football, and that means we're going to be here the rest of the, of the month. Darian Davis says, who you like next week, Auburn or Florida? I think next week is where Florida's chickens come home to roost just a little bit. <laughs> Tying this back into some recruiting talk, uh, so Javon Dexter, we were talking about him, you know, yeah. chances he goes to, to Florida. Let's say Auburn loses to – or Auburn beats Florida, which I think Auburn will be the favorite in yeah. that game. Next week, the week after that, Florida goes to LSU. Uh-huh. I mean, if, if LSU is the team you think they are, right. that, that's an easy that's win. An easy, should be an easy win. I've also been wrong about plenty, but it should be an easy win. Florida then has to go at South Carolina the week after that. I, I don't know if you want to be doing that after playing Auburn and LSU back yeah, to back. That's a really good call right there. And that's they, a good look ahead. And then they got a bye week, and then they play Georgia. So there is a very real chance that going into the second Saturday in November, Florida's riding a four game losing streak. Boy, I'd love to There's see that. There's a realistic chance that happens. And, you know, maybe that, maybe, you know, Georgia pants at Florida again in yeah. Jacksonville this year. Maybe that. Because you know what, I'm gonna I'm gonna get off this soon to be sinking ship and hop on a ship that's going full steam ahead. I like that. Last thing here, and then we're gonna get off the air. Georgia Peach says that Bama gets all the noon games. LOL, y'all. I have never wanted anything more than for Alabama not to get a night game the rest of the season after the after the tantrum. And that's not too strong of a word to use. Tantrum. Some of their fans have thrown over Georgia getting a night game last Saturday. It's amazing to me what a topic this has been. I mean. I mentioned this on Dog Nation Daily yesterday. I got even more hate mail from Alabama fans about it yesterday. Um, Alabama fans are not happy that Georgia showed its lights before Alabama got to show its own lights here. I love the idea. I, I just hope they get noons. And as Connor said, even at 3.30, it'll be dark before the game's over with. So eventually they're going to get the uh, dark stadium. But I'd love nothing more than for every one of their games to kick off while it's still daylight. Uh, really good. I, I said that's going to be the last comment. I'm going to stay to my word on this. Thank you for being here. Part of Before the Hedge is presented by Kroger. Obviously, next Wednesday back here at 3 p.m., Jeff Sintel will be back in his customary spot. We'll look forward to delivering the show to you. But if you normally tune into this show, I'll remind you that tomorrow morning I'll be here live at 10 a.m. for Dog Nation Daily. Hope you'll check that out as we uh, take a trip around the world of Georgia football. Some of that involves recruiting. Some of that involves uh, what's going on with the team itself getting ready for Tennessee next Saturday. So we'll be busy tomorrow. I hope you'll join us right here for Dog Nation Daily. But for now, thanks for being here on Before the Hedges presented by Kroger. We'll see you again next week at this same time.